The show that reveals how extraordinary items in our world are designed, constructed and produced. See the engineering, the technology and big ideas that make the world go round. Find out how it works. Coming up, the Spider-Man of Hong Kong. How towering scaffolds are built out of bamboo. Making a wood-burning stove from sheets of industrial steel to a romantic fireplace. And paddy fields in California, the high-tech process that's helped America to become one of the world's major rice exporters. But first, mobile phones. Today, it's difficult to imagine life without them. We don't just use them to make calls, but to send texts and emails, and even to take snapshots. But how do they fit so many gadgets into such a small handset? No matter how many features a phone's got, if it doesn't look good, it won't sell. So it all begins with a designer who sketches out some ideas. They draw inspiration from current trends in fashion and sport. But the real challenge is to come up with a phone that will be the must-have accessory in six months' time. Once a design has been approved, they make a few prototypes with slight variations to see which model works best. The phone has to be tough enough to survive in the real world, so the models go through a series of rigorous examinations. First, it's the Oops, I Dropped My Phone test. When a mobile slips through your fingers, it doesn't always land on a soft rug. So they drop it from about five feet onto a solid surface. It should also be able to take a few knocks while it's still in the box. If you're planning on going mountain biking with it, it'd better survive this test. It also has to survive those texting addicts who can't keep their fingers off the buttons. This machine presses each button 150,000 times. And then there's the jeans pocket test. Sand, dust and paper shavings might not be what you keep in your pockets, but it's good to know that the phone can handle it. A machine slides the phone in and out of the pocket for 18 hours, simulating four years of wear and tear. As well as being durable, this high-tech gadget should be easy to use. Here, an occasional phone user picked from the general public is monitored as she finds her way around the menus. Any hesitations are recorded, so the phone can be made more user-friendly. prototype that makes it through all these tests can then be mass-produced. Here at the factory, they can make up to 50,000 phones in a single day. The base for the phone's circuitry is a conductor board. They're made six at a time. A template is laid onto the boards and a machine spreads tin over the exposed areas. The tin acts as a glue for the various electrical components, some of which are literally microscopic. It would take an age and probably drive you mad if you tried to place them all by hand. Thankfully, a robot does the job. 
It takes the tiny components from off these spools and places them into the phones with pinpoint accuracy. There are 300 of the tiny components in each phone, but it doesn't take long to fit them, just a tenth of a second each. Once assembled, the conductor board is heated in an oven at 270 degrees Celsius. The heat causes the tin to melt and solder the parts in place. Almost everything is done by robots, but fitting the lens for the camera is an exception. It's slotted into place and then connected to the camera chip. Next, the screen and the inner keypad are assembled. This weighted metal wheel causes the phone to vibrate when it rings. Now all of the parts can move into their new home. The whole unit is neatly screwed together and then it's passed along the line. Mobile phones come with all kinds of extras, but they all have one function in common. They make calls. They do this by translating the sound of your voice into digital information and then sending it onto another phone, which translates it back into sound. Each phone is assigned a 17-digit number, giving it a unique identity. The cover is added and it's boxed up with battery, charger and instructions. Finally, the boxes weigh to within a fraction of a gram to make sure that nothing's missing. And it's ready, the high-tech device that's both a blessing and a curse of modern life. Hong Kong's skyline is dominated by a growing number of skyscrapers. To build them, you need sturdy scaffolding structures. But here, instead of steel or aluminium, they're made of bamboo. Bamboo has been used in the construction industry all over Asia for centuries. Its flexibility, strength, and the fact that it's light and easy to transport make it an excellent material for the trade. It takes about four years to grow to the right size. It's chopped down, dried for around two months, and then cut down to seven meter tubes. On site, a crane lifts a pile of bamboo up to a height of over 100 meters. The workers will use it to erect the scaffolding for the next two floors. Working up here is a scary business. With no harness attached, a worker brings the next tube into position using just his balance. Whilst scaffolding on our shores is fixed with steel fittings, here the frame is lashed together with plastic straps. Originally bamboo strips were used, but they tended to rot in bad weather and were replaced. With the agility of Spider-Man, these guys balance at 120 meters in the air on a structure of just bamboo and plastic. It might not be everyone's career choice, but in Hong Kong, scaffolding is a well-paid job which is also well-respected. And of course, the views are fantastic. The grid the scaffolders create is made of squares, approximately 75 centimeters on each side. As well as giving the structure the strength it needs, it makes a convenient climbing frame too. On any given day, there can be hundreds of scaffolders clambering over the bamboo towers around Hong Kong. Extra thick tubes are fixed diagonally forming braces for the organic structure. 
Other types of wood would break under this kind of strain, but bamboo is hollow, and this gives it the strength to make these structures possible. It's an excellent alternative to the metal tubes that are used in other parts of the world, but it is weather sensitive and there's a risk of rotting. For the scaffolders who climb these gigantic frames every day, the idea that it may fall apart is not a pleasant one. A way to make their work safer is to reinforce the bamboo grid with sturdy, weather-resistant steel tubes. However, instead of replacing the bamboo, the steel just gives it the support it needs to reach greater heights safely. As Hong Kong is experiencing a growth boom and demand for new buildings is increasing, the construction industry keeps traditional methods alive whilst also keeping its Spider-Men safe. Coming up after the break. Shaping steel for that luxurious feel. The making of a modern wood-burning stove. And how a high-tech process is helping the Americans to sell rice to China. Rice is one of the most important foodstuffs in the world. It forms the staple diet for over two billion people. Rice grows best in submerged paddy fields. That's because it handles the wet conditions better than the weeds it's in competition with. Here in California, the fields are drained in September so that huge combine harvesters can move in to collect the crop. They pull the plants in at the front and thresh them. This separates the grains from the rest of the plant. Despite only producing about 2% of the world's rice, the US is actually one of the major exporters due to its comparatively low consumption. The grains are transferred to tractors and onto trucks, which take them to a processing plant. During harvesting season, up to 3,600 tons of rice arrive at this plant every day. The delivery is weighed and a sample is taken to monitor the quality of each load. Once it's been registered, the load is released to begin its long journey through the plant. High-powered conveyor belts carry the rice to the top of the 24-metre high silos. Each one can hold 4,000 tonnes of rice. At this point, the rice's moisture content is around 22%. As it slides down along this grid, hot air brings that down to about 13%, which makes it hard enough to survive the next stage without getting damaged. It's passed through a mill with rubber rollers which remove the chaff. The light chaff is then blown away by a gentle stream of air. What's left is the choice of health fanatics, brown rice, though most of us prefer the white variety, which isn't as chewy. Brown rice is known as the healthy variety because the brown husk contains a lot of the nutrients. Here, to get the best of both worlds, they heat the rice under high pressure, and this forces those nutrients inside the center of the grain. Then another set of rollers can remove the brown husk, but leave the nutrients behind.
there will always be some cheeky brown rice that makes it through. So every grain passes a laser scanner. Any not quite white enough is detected and quickly dealt with by a jet of air. All that remains is for the rice to be weighed and bagged for its journey across the world. About 25% of the rice grown here in California will be shipped to Asia to help meet the huge demand. Whether it's healthy brown or healthy white, this humble grain continues to be one of the most important staples on the planet. There's nothing more romantic than a traditional open fire. But if you want a modern alternative, you can go for one of these wood-burning stoves. The stove consists of an inner furnace and an outer shell. It's mostly made out of steel, and here a large sheet is cut into furnace walls for over 20 stoves. It's loaded into a laser cutter that slices through the steel like a hot knife through butter. It's incredibly accurate and burns through the metal with a temperature of over 1600 degrees Celsius. All the leftover steel is hauled away with a heavy-duty hook attached to a hoist and will be melted down and reused. This is one of 46 steel pieces that will make each stove. Obviously, the walls need to fit together perfectly, so they're all checked over by a quality controller. A three-ton barrel rolls the sheets into shape to make the curved sides of the furnace. The steel sheet might not be giving you that warm glow right now, but all that will change. The curvature is checked on a template. Another operator bends each edge twice so the chamber walls can be slotted together. Again, the template is used to check the joints will fit together perfectly. Here, the walls of the furnace are assembled. They're held together using a series of clamps. And the chamber begins to take shape. The corners are welded manually to hold the pieces in place. A robot then welds all the seams to form a solid structure. It only takes 12 minutes to finish the job. Although the stove is meant to heat the living room, the exterior shouldn't get too hot or it would be a fire risk. So in the workshop next door, an outer shell is being assembled. There are only a few seams, so it doesn't take long to weld by hand.
This is where the furnace gets put in the shell. Each unit weighs 80 kilos, so to save his back, this man uses a hoist to carry it for him. It's time for some cosmetic work. In this chamber, thousands of tiny steel balls are blasted around the stove for 15 minutes to give it a textured finish. The hoist lifts the stove from the chamber, and then the steel balls are tipped out. Then a tray for the ash and a cast iron grate are put into place. One of the workers hooks up an airbrush system and gives the whole unit a fine coat of protective varnish. It will resist temperatures of up to 600 degrees Celsius. Next, a heat resistant layer of insulation is inserted into the furnace. It may look like cork, but it's actually a mineral called vermiculite. So you can gaze at your romantic fire but keep it safely locked up, an armoured glass door is installed. It's got to be tough enough to take the odd knock, so it's tested with this 10 kilo steel ball. The stove is complete, but there's still work to be done. Strict safety guidelines must be followed when installing one, so experienced fitters make sure it's done properly. They need to ensure the smoke will be extracted safely. Here, they're going to channel it through a disused chimney shaft. They check there's a draft and the shaft hasn't been blocked. After the stove has been moved into place, the flue is fixed into position. A base plate is slid under the furnace to protect the flooring and the job's done. The workers start the first fire to make sure everything is working perfectly. Not only do wood-burning stoves give you that loving feeling, they're also very efficient and an ecologically sound way to heat your home.